Our three adventurers, Kezia from Kenya, Casilla from Brazil, and Gabi from Germany go out to sea on an ocean safari. Within minutes, they come across southern right whales and learn more about these majestic creatures. Whales were hunted almost to extinction. Now they have made a comeback, or have they? The next stop is the Two Oceans Aquarium in Cape Town, South Africa, where our team go down into a large tank with ragged tooth sharks. These sharks are ambassadors teaching people about the plight of sharks in our oceans. After a few years, these raggies will be released back into the ocean. A small pond has held a secret for centuries. Now, tourists visit the pond to see and feed the eels that live here. These eels will leave the pond at around age 10, travel kilometers over land and through water to get to the sea, where their real journey begins, traveling thousands of kilometers further to the spawning grounds off the northern coast of Madagascar. Welcome to a lovely day at the beach and we're here at Plettenberg Bay. Now Plettenberg Bay is on the south coast of South Africa. It's about 400 kilometers away from Cape Town. And we're just about to go out into the ocean for some ocean safari adventures. Now I don't know what we're going to expect, but really I think we're going to see some dolphins and some whales and some bird life, sea life. I know you want to come with me, so let's go. I'm looking in this, uh, this is a man, definitely sound bright whales. Okay. Let's say about 10 minutes, that's uh -huh. our record. Uh -huh. Where we expect to find our first yeah. sight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> excellent. Ocean Blue Adventures offers ocean safaris for tourists. Having a special permit, their boat can approach whales up to 50 meters instead of the usual 300 meter restriction. This allows for up close and personal encounters. The boat is launched in a very unusual way. A four-wheel drive vehicle pushes the boat off the sandy beach at high speed. There we go. Hey, there we go. That's the launch. Yeah. Okay, folks. What we're gonna do now towards the left hand side is Kierbom area. Towards the right is the Robert Peninsula. So if we're going to be running this direction, we'll be actually searching for the southern right whale. Guess what? We just gone past a southern right whale. And remember that the armors can actually pick up the sound from the engines. They are aware of the presence of the boat. If you look at this one at 12 o'clock, coming towards us, um, it's a good sign that the animal might be comfortable with the presence of the boat. Oh, there we go, look at that. That's now less than 10 meters, less than 10 meters. Remember that how big this animals can grow. One can be the length of about 60, sorry, 16 meters and 60 ton. So they'll weigh 60 ton and the length will be 16 meters. So it's a huge animal because now if you compare them to elephants, let's say you'll need about 11 elephants for one of this. 
Right whales were named by the whalers as the right whale to kill on a hunt. When they harpooned these whales, they didn't sink, but floated because of their blubber. At top speed, they can travel only 17 kilometers per hour, so they were very easy to hunt. The whaling station in Plattenberg Bay opened in 1910 and was run by Norwegians. It was closed down in 1918. As it became clear that stocks were nearly depleted worldwide, right whaling was banned in 1937. Since hunting ceased, stocks have been growing at around 7% annually. Remember England used to light up the streets with oil blubber or the whale blubber, but uh, at least electricity kicked in which is good, so I can protect the animals. Yeah, but there's still countries, it's, it's sad, there's still countries that are still doing some hunting. And uh, yeah, it's not nice. No, it's not, it's not good. Because these animals are not causing any harm. They're not causing any harm. When a single calf is born, it measures between five and six meters and weighs 800 kilograms to one ton. The calf suckles 500 to 600 liters of milk per day and stays with the mother for up to three years. When it comes to calving, the, remember that the female need what's called a midwife. So the role of this midwife is that when the other females is having already have the calf, is that the calf do not float when it's born, it sinks because we born the head first, which means it goes down. And the role of the smithwife is to help this other female to bring the calf up on the surface for its first breath. Advice, if it does happen that this whale go under the boat or below the boat, um, just stay calm. Don't do anything except when it pops up on the other side and it takes its pictures. <laughs> Remember that is a message that they are not aggressive. This is not, um, what do you call it, Moby Dick. So we're going to carry on and head down the coastline and have a look for more. But with uh, regulations, folks, um, everybody please just know this, is uh, if we drive past whales and uh, anything to do with the mother and the calf, know that we cannot stay. We have to go past. the cows just rolling around all over the place, eh? having fun. Life is good. Such a beautiful thing to see. Eh? Look at that. Wow, yeah. Okay, this is how it looks like. It looks like upside down. Eh? Yeah. 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 So what we see is like this part. I'll say about 15%, unless if the whale do what's called breaching, jumping out. Around Plettenberg Bay's peninsula, about 4,500 Cape fur seals have made their home. The Cape fur seal is only found around the coast of the southern tip of Africa. It is an inquisitive, curious and friendly animal when in the water and will often accompany scuba divers on their dives. They will swim around divers for several minutes at a time, even at depths of up to 60 meters. On land, they are far less relaxed and a bit wary of people. As with so many other animals, there is competition between humans and seals for food, and this has led to the inevitable conflict of interest. And what our skipper is going to do now, the real truth, is that he's going to actually have to drive this boat on a fast pace back to land. As the boat's going to go off the water, it's going to go sand bank, slide, and come to a quick stop or sudden stop. Now my advice to everybody, please everybody, use the rail in front of you, hold tight. Tiere 
in ihrer natürlichen Umgebung zu beobachten, ist einfach faszinierend. Ob es ein Waljunges ist, den seine Mutter im niedrigen Wasser springen lehrt, oder ob es Seehunde sind, die mit den Wellen auf den Wellen surfen. All das zeigt mir etwas von der Vielfalt und von der Großartigkeit Gottes, der all das erschaffen hat. Und das zu beobachten, ist wirklich spannend. Situated at Cape Town's waterfront, the Two Oceans Aquarium showcases the unique marine life of the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, which lie on either side of the Cape of Good Hope. With more than 3,000 marine creatures on view, there is a lot to see and enjoy. The main 2 million liter tank is an exhibit of species of the warmer east coast of South Africa. Seawater is pumped in from the colder Atlantic Bay, warmed and circulated through the various tanks. Five large ragged tooth sharks live in the predator tank together with many other species of fish. Qualified divers can go diving inside the predator tank with the ragged tooth sharks. Gabi and Andre decided they would go down and see what they could find. Ragatooth sharks, also known as grey nurse sharks in Australia and as sand tiger sharks in the USA, occur in temperate to tropical coastal waters of the Atlantic, Indian and Western Pacific Oceans. Like all sharks, ragatooth sharks have a cartilaginous skeleton. They grow to about 3,2 meters in length and live to about 30 years of age. Sharks' teeth are arranged in rows that continually move slowly forward, like conveyor belts. This ensures a constant supply of sharp new teeth and results in sharks losing and replacing thousands of teeth in a lifetime. Divers in the aquarium like to look for shark teeth on the floor of the tank. Ragatooth sharks as a species are threatened around the world because they are slow to reach sexual maturity, give birth to few young, and, because of their inshore habits, are highly vulnerable to overfishing. Eagle rays are bottom dwellers which use camouflage, toxic spines or electric shocks to defend themselves against predators. Giant yellowtail live in the cold Atlantic waters off the Cape Coast. During the annual sardine run, they migrate towards the eastern coast of southern Africa to feast on the sardines. 
These juvenile ragged-tooth sharks act as ambassadors for their species as the aquarium only displays them for a short period of time before returning them to the wild. Once they reach a certain size, they will release them further east, at Buffalo's Bay, where other ragged-tooth sharks of similar age are found. When I was here on the side, I was imagining what our team was looking for embaixo, em vez de nadar e tal. E aí, quando eles vieram para o lado de fora, eu recebi um presente especial do pessoal. O dente do tubarão. Ok, so we're here at Palang Hut. I'm very excited. We're just about to take a look at the freshwater eels. Now, the freshwater eels are about maybe seven or eight of them and maybe 15 years of age. But we are going to go and find out and find all that out. But we have to feed them to get them out. So you want to come with me? Let's go. Generations of these eels have been living in this freshwater pool probably long before they were discovered by people who came to live in the area. These eels belong to the Anquilla genus and are called Anquilla mosambica or long-finned eels. Guy out? <laughs> okay, so here I am. I'm going to try and get this girl out. I know she's down here. So I'm going to put my hand in and see if you come and, as if I'm feeding her. So, um... Where are you? Where are you? Come on. There she is. There she is. Come on. Come on. Ah, there you are. She likes to be stroked a little bit and touched. The more gentle, the better for you. Hmm, she feels a little slimy, but I guess she lives in water. Come, let's give her another one. Come on, another one? Ah, here we go, here we go. There you go. You see? Ah, oh, you can see as I stroke her, she leans into me. I guess she likes being touched. The house at the back is um, the oldest house in Storboy. It was built in 189 and it was burnt down and rebuilt in 1814. And they built the house here because of the fresh water which they use in the gardens and also in the house. And the, the children used to play with the, in the water and they found the eels here. And they also used to play with the eels. And when we opened the, the bureau in, in 1992, we started to feed the, the eels. And it's an income for the tourism bureau. Um, there's visitors every day of the year, but during the season, we normally have about like 100, 120 people just to, they just come to see the, the feeding of the time eels. After feeding in fresh water for around 10 to 20 years, the eels are ready to start their long journey to the ocean to breed. Their external features undergo dramatic changes, the eyes start to enlarge in size. The eye pigments change for optimal vision in dim blue clear ocean light. And the sides of their bodies turn silvery to create a counter shading pattern to make them difficult to see by predators during their long open ocean migration. From many southern African river systems, the eels make their long journey to their spawning grounds in the Indian Ocean north of Madagascar. To accurately return to the same place and at the same time, eels use the Earth's magnetic field in order to navigate. They travel thousands of kilometers to meet up with the males where they mate and spawn. The larvae are then carried to the coast by the ocean currents. The young eels, known as elvers, swim up the rivers mainly at night to reach freshwater ponds and dams where they will live most of their lives until the cycle begins again. They go out with the stream, especially with that stream going down there. And when they reach a place where they can't swim, they just get out of the water and then they become slimy and they breathe through their skins and they can move over the ground, they can move over land. 
um, and when they reach a place where they can't swim again, they just get back into the water and they go down to the river and down to the sea. The life cycle of an eel used to be a simple affair before man started building obstacles like dam walls and weirs across rivers. Amazingly, the elvers managed to overcome most obstacles on their journey, but in some cases these man-made obstacles do prevent the natural migration of eels. In many parts of the world, eel populations have been reducing rapidly recently. The destruction of freshwater wetlands, over-exploitation and the construction of dams and weirs have all led to this decrease. They, they like it when you touch them. <laughs> Can you see the blue eyes? Slippery, you can't just take them out, get them out. It was a humbling experience being in a tank with such large sharks. I comment the well-run aquariums around the world that help educate people about our oceans and how we can save them. What fascinated me the most was the fact that eels travel so far and know exactly where to return. It's as if they have their own built-in GPS. It is likely that the eel integrates a sort of map for the journey that she will use to return someday to continue the cycle of life. How amazing that they had GPS long before we had it. When I see the huge wells, I cannot help but marvel at God's creation. He created tiny microscopic creatures as well as these majestic wells that travel almost across the globe in our precious oceans and return each year to Kov and for us to see them. Thank you for joining us on Animal Encounters. As we have experienced and encountered these wonderful creatures, may it bring you closer to an encounter with their wonderful creator. Until next week, God bless.